Welcome again to the Compass Church online gathering. I want to invite you here. Thank you for carving out time on your Sunday to gather with us. My name is Murray. I'm one of the pastors here. And this is a very exciting week for everybody who is a Christian around the world because we, this is known as Passion Week. This is the start of Jesus going to be crucified and then ultimately his resurrection. And so we are reminded this week, it is Palm Sunday. This is where we reflect of how Jesus came into Jerusalem and people were laying down palm branches and they were worshiping him as a king. And they said to him, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And what's ironic about this is that many of those people would be in that same crowd a couple days later yelling, crucify him, crucify him. This coming Friday is Good Friday. And I want to invite you back here on Friday at 10 a.m. for our online Good Friday service. And it's going to be a time where we're reflecting on what Jesus did for us by going to the cross and dying for us. And as we, we gather here on Good Friday, uh, it's a real pointer to Sunday, Easter Sunday, where Jesus did not stay in the grave but he rose again and we serve a king who is alive. This past week, I've had time just to reflect on everything that's going on in the world and in my own heart. And there's a song that just really hit my heart this week. It's called Revive Us Again. Murray Luther needs to be revived again. I, I was shown just in my own life, just where I've been so complacent in my own faith with God and things that I just kind of used as as just blockers in my life sports being one I, I love hockey and it's gone um, and whatever yours uh, this distraction of life is maybe it was your money maybe it was sports teams maybe it was something else maybe it was your work and all those things are just being flatlined and as I was reminded uh, in this song, it says, from sea to sea. As reminded of Psalms 72, 8, it says, may he have dominion from sea to sea. Here's an interesting thing about that Psalms. In the Peace Tower in Ottawa, that is inscripted on it, saying, may he have dominion from sea to sea. I want to pray for us as we gather here. Blair's got another great message for us. And let's just... Yeah, just unite our hearts in prayer. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for you being our rock this week. How you revive us. How you take dead people and you bring life into us. And Jesus, what a great reminder in my own life this past week. Just how you bring the life. You bring hope amidst this just tragedy of what's going on. And Jesus, may we just look to you as our hope. I pray for everybody watching this today. You know their hearts. You know exactly where they stand with you. And Jesus, we just plead with you to move in all our hearts today. We love you lots. Amen.
Well, good morning. Pastor Blair here. I want you to grab your Bibles. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 26 this morning. So Matthew chapter 26. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. So if you want to find your way there on your device or your Bible, that would be great. So like Murray mentioned, today is Palm Sunday. And uh, it's a day that Jesus came into Jerusalem on a colt and the people laid down uh, their palm branches and their cloaks and they began to sing out to Jesus and it's the beginning of what we call Passion Week and so this is Easter week and we're really looking forward to Easter Sunday this next week Good Friday and we're gonna have a Good Friday gathering at 10 o'clock on Friday so we'll look forward to that as well so Matthew chapter 26 this morning starting in verse 14 is where we're gonna go but let me pray for us as we dive into God's word together. Father God, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. And we pray that, that this morning, Lord, as we gather in our homes with uh, family and some friends, Lord, I pray that you would help us to be able to focus our mind and to focus our heart upon what you want to teach us today. And we give you thanks, Lord. We thank you that we can, even in this way, open up your word together and study together. So help us, Lord, just to focus our mind and our heart upon what you want to teach us this morning. We give you thanks. Amen. You know, Billy Graham was uh, once asked a question, uh, and the question was this, if, if you knew as a young preacher what you know today, would you emphasize anything more as a young preacher that you find yourself emphasizing today? So basically, a look back. If you were to do it again, knowing what you know now, what would you do different? I found Billy Graham's response uh, quite fascinating when without missing a beat he said this i would preach more on the cross and on the blood because that is where the power is there's power in the message of the cross there is power in the resurrection of jesus and passion week as we lead this week into easter it's an opportunity for us to reflect once again on the power of the cross and the power of the resurrection of jesus you see the resurrection of Jesus is the cornerstone of the Christian faith. The resurrection of Jesus is what the Christian faith hinges upon. That Jesus rose from the grave, that he conquered sin, Satan, and death. John Stott said this, he said, Christianity is in its very essence a resurrection religion. The concept of resurrection lies at its heart. If you remove it, Christianity is destroyed. Now in Matthew 26, the passage that we're going to be looking at this morning together, in the hours leading up to Jesus' arrest and his ultimate trial and death on the cross, Jesus tells his disciples as they're gathered together in the upper room, he tells them that one of those disciples in that room would betray him. So let's look at this together, starting in Matthew 26, verse 14. It says this, Then one of the twelve whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? Him being Jesus. What would you give me if I turn Jesus over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray Jesus. This morning, we're going to re be reflecting upon this man, Judas. Now, Judas is... One of those characters in the Bible that we especially talk about at Easter because of Judas's role in the betrayal of Jesus. But often Judas sort of gets this cursory overview as we move on in the Easter story. And I want to take some time to focus upon what we can learn from Judas this morning. And Judas is one of those characters that, um, you know, of all the Bible characters and all the disciples, people often name their kids after. I don't know anyone who names their kid Judas. Because even if you're not a Christian, you know that the name Judas carries with it that story, that betrayal of Christ. And so nobody names their kid Judas. You know, oftentimes when we think about Judas, we think of him as this sort of, this evil guy, right? That it was that guy who betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, you know? You kind of picture like Megamind. He has this big head and this big collar and a black cape, you know? And he, and he just, he's just calling out, you know, I make bad look so good. You know, that's the kind of image that we have of Judas. And we sort of, oh, we kind of go over him and go, oh man, what an awful guy Judas was. And therefore, we, we never name our kids Judas. 
You see, when it comes to Easter, and we reflect upon this story, we need to remember that Judas was one of the twelve. He was part of the squad that walked with Jesus. He witnessed the miracles of Jesus. He walked with Jesus. He was taught by Jesus. He was empowered by Jesus for ministry. Let's continue on in verse 17. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? So the Passover was a celebration that the Jewish people celebrated every year. And it was the reason Jesus came to Jerusalem. Because Passover was one of two Jewish festivals where it required a, a pilgrimage back to Jerusalem in order to celebrate it. And so Jesus and his disciples made their way back to Jerusalem. Now the Passover itself, the festival itself, finds its, its meaning and its background uh, from the very beginning of the Bible, in the book of Exodus, which is, is the second book of the Bible, and in that book, you have Jesus, you have God raising up this man named Moses, and he sends Moses into Egypt to confront Pharaoh and, and plead with Pharaoh to allow the Israelites to leave the captivity and the slavery that they had been under at the hand of the Egyptians for hundreds of years. And so Moses goes, and, and you, you, you probably heard the story, and as Moses is pleading with Pharaoh continually over and over, Pharaoh says, you know, I'm not going to let the Israelites go. I mean, if he lets the Israelites go, their whole way of life crumbles as the Egyptians, because the Israelites, who are in the millions, serve the Egyptians as slaves. So the tenth plague that God brought upon Pharaoh and the Egyptians was... A plague, it was one of the worst plagues of them all. And it was the plague where, where there was the death of the firstborn in Egypt. But you see, on the night of Passover, um, of the 10th plague, on that particular night, God had told the Israelites that, that they were to, to, to sacrifice a spotless lamb and then to mark their doorposts and their lintels of their door with the blood of that lamb. And... And then when the, when the Lord would come and see the blood on the doorpost, he would, he would pass over the households, the households of the Israelites that showed that blood on their doors. So in a very real, real way, the blood of the lamb saved the Israelites from death. The blood of the lamb saved the Israelites from death. They were saved from this tenth plague that the firstborn in all the land would be killed, but the Israelites were saved as a result. So every year, the Israelites would get together and they would celebrate and they would remember the provision of God through the Passover, that event that happened so many years before. In verse 18, he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they had prepared the Passover. Verse 20. When it was evening, he reclined at the table with the twelve. So picture the squad, right? Jesus and his disciples, they're, they're, they're sitting at the table. They're getting ready to celebrate and to remember the Passover meal. And they're all reclined at the table. And as they're eating, he said, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, Is it I, Lord? Now notice when Jesus asks this question, when he talked about someone who would betray him, the, the disciples didn't look around the room and go, Well, obviously it's Judas, the guy in the black mamba sitting over there with the shifty eyes. They didn't look around the room saying, oh, for sure it's Judas. Judas was one of them. And, and Judas was a respected disciple. And it, was, it wasn't like everyone thought, oh, easy answer. It's Judas. See, Judas made a commitment to Jesus. There, there's no reason to think that Judas' faith was anything but sincere. Like the rest of the disciples... Uh, who followed Jesus and learned from him, like the rest of them, Judas left everything he had to follow Jesus and was actively involved in the ministry. And, and he, was, he was equipped with remarkable spiritual gifts. Luke tells us that Jesus called the twelve together. 
and he, uh, he gave them power and authority over all the demons to cure diseases, and then he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God in Luke chapter 12, or chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. So God had equipped the disciples. Judas was one of those. And we often forget that when we think about Judas. We just picture Judas as that guy, right, who betrayed Jesus. And yet Judas was involved in the ministry as every other disciple of Jesus was involved in the ministry. Judas was a gospel preacher. And he was given this gift of healing. He was given this gift to exercise authority over demons. He was actively involved in ministry. And this was a good and a wonderful thing. Judas was, in fact, one of the more respected of the disciples because it was Judas whom the disciples said, Judas, we want you to handle the money that comes in that's collected. So you can be the accountant, if you will, the treasurer for the disciples. So Judas was respected enough to be given the authority to handle the finances that, that people would give to the ministry of the disciples, to the feeding of the poor, to whatever the needs were during that time. The, the, the thing we need to realize is, is when we think about Judas, you don't put a shady guy that you know to be shady in, in charge of your finances. That, that's just not what people do. And so when Jesus asked the disciples and told them around that table that one of you would betray me, none of the other disciples thought, oh, for sure, this is going to be Judas. They all respected and they all trusted Judas as one of them. And Jesus responds to, to them in their question saying, you know, is it I? Is it I, Jesus? Uh, who is it? You know, is it I? And Jesus responds in verse 23. He answered, he who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. Now in John's account, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the Gospels. And the Gospels are, are the, the, the stories of the life of Jesus, the life and ministry of Jesus. And, and so each of the Gospels has a, a, an accounting of various things that Jesus taught and did. And in John's account of this particular story, this particular um, uh, gathering at Passover, Jesus dips the bread and then he, he hands the bread to Judas. It, basically, what Jesus is saying is this. The one who shares this piece of bread with me is the betrayer. And he dips it in and he gives it to Judas. Uh, articulating that Judas is the betrayer. And in John's account, after Jesus does this and gives Judas this piece of bread, Judas immediately gets up from around that gathering and he immediately leaves. Verse 24. The Son of Man goes as, as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? And he said to him, You have said so. Now here's what I want us to understand this morning as we reflect on the person of Jesus, of Jesus and, the, and, and the person of Judas and what he did. I want us to understand this morning something really important. Judas represents all of us. Judas represents all of us. In verse 14 and 15, at the very beginning of this passage, what does Judas do? He goes to the chief priests and he asks them, how much will you give me to betray Jesus? What will it take? What is the price? Now, of course, that night there are two people who knew exactly who it was that was going to betray Jesus. It was Judas himself who knew and it was Jesus who knew as well. But even though Jesus knew, listen to this, even though Jesus knew the who, he still frames the imminent betrayal more, than, more as a question. He doesn't say, we have a traitor in our midst, you know, dun, 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 and it's him, Judas. He doesn't do that. Instead, Jesus basically looks and he says, one of you will sell me out for the right price. Is it you? Is it you? Looking at the disciples, is it you? Look at your hearts and be honest. We know that the disciples felt this weight. And you can tell that when you, what, what, the weight of the question that Jesus had for them, they, they felt that weight upon their souls because of how shaky and uncertain their response was. Is it I? 
it, it, it shows this lack of confidence. It, it, it's almost like you could say, you know, it's kind of like this. Hey, Lord, is it, is it me? Like, it's not me, is it, Lord? It's not me, is it? Remember, every single one of Jesus' disciples had betrayed him, had abandoned him in his hours of need. Peter actually abandoned him and denied him three times. Every one of those disciples had a price to which they would walk away from Jesus. You see, this is where Jesus could have answered, you know, no, no, guys, look, it's not you, Peter, it's not you, John, it's, it's just one of you, you know, the shady one that's sneaking out the door right now, it's that guy that's going to betray me. But Jesus goes on to tell them that it's not just one of the disciples that will sell him out, but rather, rather in Matthew 26, 31, he says, you will all fall away. You will all fall away. Every one of the disciples walked away, betrayed Jesus. Now the other disciples, the other 11 disciples, I mean, they, they, they may not have sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, but none of them would go all the way with Jesus. Each one of them had a price by which they would walk away. A price is a price. Look at your hearts and ask, what is the price that you're willing to walk away from Jesus? What's your price? What's your price? See, Judas's price to walk away and abandon Jesus was 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver. Consider that. 30 pieces of silver to abandon Jesus and to, to, to walk away from him. After witnessing and being empowered by the Spirit and walking with Jesus and seeing all that Jesus had done, and for 30 pieces of silver, Judas walks away. And you know what? The other disciples walked away for much less. You want to know what your price is? Follow your actions, not your words. You want to know what your price is? Follow your actions, not your words. Judas displayed actions that, that truly told what he truly loved. He loved money. The love of money is the root of all evil. And you get this glimpse into Judas's heart and in his love for money. You get this, this snapshots into his life. In particular, the story previous to this one in Matthew 26. It's the story of this woman named Mary. And Mary is so broken by Jesus. She comes to Jesus with this expensive perfume. And she pours the perfume at Jesus' feet. And, 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 she, and the disciples are looking on at Mary. And they're seeing her pour this expensive perfume on Jesus' feet. And they're thinking to themselves, what a waste of money. That she would spend this expensive, she would pour this expensive perfume on Jesus' feet. Now, when you look at John's account of this story, you get a bit more detail into Judas's heart because it outlines, outlines for us a bit of what Judas was thinking. In John chapter 12, it says this, But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Judas was a thief. Judas had allowed Satan into his life long before the, the betrayal of Jesus, long before the 30 pieces of silver. Judas had been helping himself to the money bag that, that people were giving to the poor to help support the, the, the disciples in Jesus' ministry, and he was helping himself to that money whenever he felt he had a need for it. He didn't care about the poor. He cared about himself because he had a love for money. Judas was a thief. And the thing about Judas is the same as the thing about all of us. Judas didn't wake up one day and think to himself, you know, today I'm going to trade Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. It was like, boom, you know, all of a sudden, I'm going to trade Jesus today for 30 pieces of silver. That's not what Judas woke up and thought to himself. It started way before. 
It started way before when he began to steal money that he gave Satan a foothold in his life. The same is true of all of us. Ephesians 4.27 says to give no opportunity to the devil or do not give the devil a foothold. Some translations will say, do not give the enemy, Satan, a foothold in your life. The thing about a foothold is a foothold turns to a stronghold. If you open the door to Satan in, in one little part of your life, he'll soon take over the whole thing. You give him a foothold in your life and he'll turn it into a stronghold. Let me explain it this way. In this time of this pandemic, this COVID-19 pandemic that we're all experiencing, this new kind of normal for the time being, in this, the, the, um, the doctors and the, the frontline workers and the government, they want us to social distance, which makes sense, right? We to stay away from each other so that there won't be this transmission between us. And the idea is that when we social distance, we'll flatten the curve. We'll flatten the curve. So we take the precautions that are necessary. We do what we're asked because we don't want to see people die as a result. So we social distance. The reason why we're doing what we're doing is that so, is so that we won't allow the, this virus to, to get a foothold by not caring, talking to each other, doing regular life. Because if we can prevent the virus from getting a foothold, we can flatten the curve. But if we just continue life as normal, the virus will get not only a foothold, but it will become a stronghold that we cannot stop. That's the idea around kind of... Uh, this idea of COVID-19, this is the idea about Satan getting a foothold that becomes a stronghold in our lives. You might think of it another way. Um, maybe this example will connect to you better. Think about uh, D-Day, all right? June 6, 1944, when the Allied troops invaded the beaches at Normandy. All right? The reason why they landed on the beaches of Normandy during World War II because it was, it was critical to establish a foothold on the beach. Because if they could establish a foothold, they could bring in resources and troops, and that foothold would turn into a stronghold, and then they could push forward, they'd be equipped for battle, they'd have the resources that they need, and from that tiny foothold, the Allied forces would be able to become a stronghold, and they would push forward in order to liberate France. Now, here's what you need to understand. The enemy, Satan, isn't trying to liberate you. He wants to establish a foothold in your life in order to take more and more of your life. And once he gets deep enough in an area of sin, he turns that foothold into a stronghold, and that makes it harder and harder for you and I to take back control of our lives. You see, long before Judas had traded Jesus for 30 pieces of, of silver, Judas had allowed the enemy to get a foothold in his life, and he began to steal, and he began to have a love for money, and he began to help himself to the money that was there for the disciples' ministry. And Satan had this foothold in his life, and that foothold became a stronghold. So we need to understand that the enemy doesn't get a foothold in the dramatic things of life, but in the normal tiny steps of life. Judas invited Satan to get a foothold in his life by one day thinking to himself, well, what harm would it be if I just took what I needed? Well, I'll replace it for sure. I'll replace the money, but I need a little money. So I'm going to take money out of the money bag for myself. Well, sure enough, that's easy thing to do and he doesn't replace the money, and all of a sudden it becomes the pattern of his life, and he becomes a, th he becomes a thief, and that foothold becomes a stronghold. The big sort of Netflix quarantine show that everyone is talking about, and uh, you see all kinds of memes and stuff on the internet about, is the show um, Tiger King. All right? It's kind of the redneck version of Game of Thrones, if you haven't seen it. It's, uh, it's absolutely crazy. It's so crazy that it's addictive. And, and it's essentially about these big cat zoos, these tiger zoos, and uh, the way that they interact with each other and the selling of animals and 
this battle between a man by the name of Joe Exotic and Carol Baskin. Now, Carol Baskin in Tiger King, you see her over and over and over riding her bicycle. And I don't know of anyone more menacing than Carol Baskin riding a bicycle. But in the show, she, they're in this battle and it's this intricate kind of weaving of these strange lives together. I read one tweet that said this, Joe Exotic will go down as the man who single-handedly helped us get through COVID-19. I tell you this because in the show there's this particular scene where there's this worker who, who, who uh, inadvertently put their hand inside of a tiger cage. Um, and they were always warned, never stick your hand inside the cage. But this worker put her hand inside of the cage and the lion bit her arm off. I mean, talk about dramatic TV. So her arm is bitten off and it's all kind of caught on camera. And, and all throughout the show, there's this consistent reminder of the inherent danger of a lion waiting for the opportunity to pounce. The Bible describes our enemy, Satan, as a lion, a roaring lion, waiting for the opportunity to pounce. In 1 Peter 5, 8, Scripture says this, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Satan doesn't look for the dramatic things of life to get a foothold, but in the everyday prowling, looking about in your life and my life, looking for an open door to get a foothold so that, that Satan might get a stronghold in our lives. And it happens in the normal, everyday part of our lives. You know, recently I, uh, I, I discovered in a, in a small way the way the insidiousness of the way the enemy prowls around in our lives. And uh, I had been having trouble sleeping, and so I was prescribed, last time I went to, a, to the doctors, prescribed um, sleeping pills for the occasional nights that I couldn't sleep. Well, I began taking the sleeping pills, and I slept great, and I enjoyed the sleep that I was getting, and it was good for me. And, and after a certain amount of time, I realized on the nights that I couldn't, I, I, that I didn't take one of those pills, was the nights that I couldn't sleep. So what do you do when it's two in the morning and you're laying there and you can't sleep, you take a sleeping pill? Well, this will help me get through the night. And it wasn't very long before I realized that the sleeping pills that I was to take occasionally for insomnia, I was taking regularly just to get a good night's sleep. And I realized, very quickly, the addictive nature of the sleeping pills. And thankfully, it was early on that I discovered this and was able to, to turn that around within a few days and be able to, to sort of try to get back to some regular rhythms without those sleeping pills. You know, I think about that in my own life, and I think about that that's the way the enemy works to get footholds in our lives. It's in subtle ways. You know, nobody wakes up one day. I didn't wake up and go, boy, you know, I, you know, I'm going to get, today's the day I'm going to get addicted to sleeping pills. You know, it wasn't until I realized I, that I couldn't sleep without them that I had to make some changes in my life. And it's a subtle, it's certainly not intentional, just subtle. But you see, that's the way the enemy works in, 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 in developing footholds that turn to strongholds in our lives. No one wakes up one day and says, to themselves, you know, I'm gonna, today's the day I'm gonna become a porn addict. Or today's the day I'm gonna leave my spouse. Today's the day I'm gonna uh, leave my church. I'm gonna walk away from community. Oh, today's the day I'm gonna become an alcoholic. People don't wake up that way. The, the, the Satan, prior to that, gets a, gets a foothold in your life, begins to whisper things into your ears, and you begin to listen to the enemy and you open that door and the enemy Satan who prowls around like a roaring lion waiting for someone to devour gets a foothold that turns to a stronghold in your life. The enemy is out to kill and destroy. What are the doors in your life that you're inviting the enemy into? What are the doors to which you have allowed to creep, creep open for you in your life and you've allowed the enemy to come in. You know, maybe it was, you know, it's in your thought life. Maybe it's in a relationship and you just open the door just enough because you think to yourself, well, it's not going to happen to me. 
but you're allowing the, the enemy an opportunity for a foothold in your life that will turn inevitably to a stronghold and will destroy your life. When you think about Judas and you think to yourself, well, I'm nothing like Judas. I mean, uh, you know, uh, how could you say that Judas represents me? Well, that's probably because you weren't put in the same situation as Judas. You weren't under the same pressures. You weren't there. But the stuff in our hearts is still the same. Left to our own devices, we betray Jesus as naturally as breathing. Yes, the focus is on Judas, but let's not forget that every one of those other 11 disciples walked away from Jesus. They fled. When Jesus was on that cross, he was on that cross alone. See, our enemy, our enemy Satan, makes a relentless assault on Judas' soul, and he makes a relentless assault on the souls of every Jesus follower. But you see, Judas opened the door to Satan. Judas had been stealing from the collective bank account. Who knows how long prior to trading Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Unconfessed sin always opens the door to Satan's power. Unconfessed sin always opens the door to Satan's power. You see, Satan doesn't gain a foothold in your life or in my life, in the lives of people who are walking in the light of Jesus. See, when sin is confessed and repentance happens, when sin is confessed, sin is brought into the light. Sin thrives. It, 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 like a cancer, sin grows in, in, in the darkness and shame and guilt of a person's life. But when sin is brought into the light and repentance happens, that's when, when change can happen in our souls. John 3, 19-21 says this, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Judas had allowed the enemy to get a foothold in his life, and that foothold became a stronghold. The question we need to ask this morning, friends, is what doors are we opening to the enemy to allow a foothold in our lives? We need to repent of those things, and we need to allow those things to be brought into the light, because unconfessed sin allows, uh, allows the enemy to continue to get strongholds in our lives. We need to bring the sin in our lives out. We need to bring the sin into our lives, into the light, so that the enemy's works can be exposed. As we, as we conclude this morning, I want us to reflect on a couple of things. We know about Judas. We've talked about Judas. We know that Judas uh, traded Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. But long before that, the enemy had gotten a foothold that turned into a stronghold in his life. Well, the other 11 disciples who had walked away from Jesus, we know of another disciple who we hear many times as we talk about Easter and Jesus going to the cross, and that's the disciple named Peter. Peter had denied Jesus three times. After saying to Jesus in the Passover meal, saying to Jesus, you know, I would never abandon you, I would never leave you. And he abandons him three times. He denies, he even knows who Jesus is. So you have these two men, they each have price, and they each responded differently to the sin that they had in their lives. In John's Gospel, in chapter 21, we see this opportunity where Peter reacts to Jesus when Jesus confronts him. Three times Jesus asks Peter if he loves him, and each time Peter responds by saying yes. But his third response is emphatic. He says, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. How Peter was remorseful after having denied Jesus. And, and this time he pledges his love and his commitment to follow Jesus. So let's contrast for a few moments Peter to Judas. We're told in Matthew 27 
verse 3, that Judas, much like Peter, regretted his actions. After realizing what he had done and, and living in the guilt and the shame of that, Jesus, it says, then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that Jesus had been condemned, deeply regretted what he had done. But the difference between Peter and Judas is this. Judas, his pride, his ego, and his shame got the best of him. See, unlike Peter, Judas was unable to come to Jesus and seek forgiveness. Judas kept his sin in the dark, where it flourished, and it brought forth, forth the, the, the guilt and the shame, rather than bringing it out into the light of repentance. You know, perhaps it was because Judas couldn't forgive himself. And oftentimes, you and I are like Judas in that way. We make decisions in our lives. We open the door of our lives to the enemy to get a stronghold in our lives that begins with a foothold. And, and, and we feel the guilt and the shame. And we think to ourselves, God will never love me because of what I've done. He'll never accept me because of what I've done. And perhaps Judas felt that same way. Perhaps he couldn't forgive himself. But in the end, what Judas does is he takes the money and he flings the money back into the temple where the chief priests were and he leaves them and he hangs himself. He hangs himself. So there you have Judas. His sin thrived in the darkness and he hanged himself. But then you have Peter, who equally abandoned Jesus, not for 30 pieces of silver, but for three times. That was his price, is the shame of knowing his Savior. And after Peter's heartfelt repentance and his pledge of love to Jesus, Jesus says to him, feed my sheep. Jesus says to him, follow me. Jesus says to him, Peter, upon this rock, upon you, I will build my church. I will use you to see the church flourish. And we see in the book of Acts the way that Jesus used Peter to grow and to speak the gospel to both Jew and Gentile throughout the ancient world. But notice that there's two vastly different outcomes. Both men regretted their actions, but Peter repented. Judas hanged himself. One brought their sin into the light, one did not. Not only was Peter forgiven, but he was commissioned as a fisher of men. And he spent the rest of his life doing just that. He eventually gave up his own life in service to his Lord and King. Similarly, God has given us everything that we need to have eternal life. However, at some point in our lives, we all betray Jesus with our words, our actions, or both. All of us have a price. We all have sin in our lives. And as we prepare ourselves and as we reflect upon Easter, perhaps we can reflect upon our own response. Knowing that we have sin in our life, what is our response to that sin? What are the doors that we've opened up in our lives to allow the enemy in? What is the response that we've had knowing that we have sin? Do we leave it in the darkness or do we expose it by bringing it into the light through repentance? Our pride gets in the way and we fail to repent and we fail to turn from our sin and in time our continued sinfulness leads us to spiritual death. You know, within 24 hours of sharing that last meal with Jesus sitting around with his disciples, within 24 hours, every one of Jesus' disciples abandoned him. And yet, you know what? Jesus would die for them anyway. What love is this? What love is this? See, when his disciples sold Jesus out for their own safety, for their own security. He offered himself up as a sacrifice without price. When they're faithless, Jesus remained faithful. When they were faithless, Jesus remained faithful. See, then that, friends, is the good news of the gospel. 
that the saving work of Jesus is not contingent upon us and our works because we are sinful people desperately in need of our Savior every single day. The gospel is not just the beginning of the Christian life. The gospel, the gospel is, the, is the bread that feeds us through the Christian life. It's the, it's the bread of life as we reflect upon the goodness of Jesus going to the cross, that he was faithful when we were unfaithful. And the picture of this, the disciples abandoning Jesus in his time of need shows the unfaithfulness of every single one of us. And yet Jesus went to the cross regardless. If there's hope for the disciples, there's hope, praise God, there's hope for you, and there's hope for me. When I betrayed Jesus, and I've done it many times, when I betrayed Jesus, he could have walked away. He had every right to walk away. Instead, he walked up that Calvary hill with that rough-hewn lumber upon his back, badly beaten, and he went to the cross and he bore my sins on that cross. Oh, what love is this? That my Savior would carry my sin upon his shoulders so that he could pour out his mercy and love to me. When I was unfaithful, he was faithful. This is the good news. We're not saved because of how committed we are to Jesus. Who among us can pass that test? We're not saved because of how committed we are to Jesus. You know, there are times in my life where, where I have an opportunity to share the good news of Jesus, and I don't. And you know why I don't? Because that's the price. And that price in that moment for me is, is a sense of like embarrassment or shame or what will people think or whatever it is, you fill in the blank because you know what your price is. We're not saved because of how committed we are to Jesus. We're saved because of how committed Jesus was to us. That although the disciples had abandoned him, that although Jesus had, had, had pleaded and told them, you, you will all fail me, and they had all left him, that in that moment, knowing that they would all leave him, Jesus went to that cross for them. Because in, in their abandonment of him, he was fully committed to them. In their unfaithfulness, in your unfaithfulness, in my unfaithfulness, the good news of the gospel is that, that Jesus is faithful to us. And he went to the cross for you and for, for me. Praise God for the good news of the gospel. Jesus, thank you for the cross. And thank you for the power of the cross. Thank you for the power of the resurrection to which we get to remember and to celebrate not only this week, but every day of our lives as a reminder of the faithfulness that you have to your unfaithful people. God, make us fully aware of the doors in our lives that we have allowed to, 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 to blow open or to, to creak open so that the enemy gets a, a foothold in our lives that turns to a stronghold. Lord, make us aware and give us the wisdom to know, to know. Lord, thank you for the good news. Lord, help us to treasure it in our mind and in our souls and that every day when we consider the, the tactics and the enemy prowling around waiting to devour us, that we might understand deeply in the very depths of our soul your great love for us and that your love for us is not contingent on what we do for you, but your love for us is because you love us regardless of what we do because your love is because of what you did, not what we do. Thank you, Jesus, for that. God, increase our faith. Lord, help us to, to take time this week to ponder the deep things of the cross and the resurrection so we reflect upon Passion Week. Continue, Lord, as we worship to just open up our hearts and give us the freedom to repent to you, to, to, to our spouse, to our friends, to people that we've hurt so that we might allow the sin and the footholds of Satan in our lives to, to be brought into the light. I pray that for each and every person that's listening this morning, Lord, Lord, you're stirring hearts. I know you're stirring hearts. So Lord, don't, don't allow us to, to click this off and to walk away and get on with our day, Lord. But would you help us to, 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 to do what's required to bring sin into the light? Would you give us ears to hear?
hear and words to say. Thank you for the good news, Jesus, in your name. Ah, oh, what a great gathering. I, I thank you again for tuning in. Thank you, Blair. Thank you, ladies, for leading us in worship today. As we head out, I, just a couple of reminders. Please join us in the lobby. I know it, it's a little awkward maybe for you at first, but being an extrovert, if you're an extrovert like me, oh, this is such a great place because you can see people, you can chat with people, and, uh, and I encourage you to join us uh, in the lobby after this gathering. Also, 10 a.m. Good Friday service. Please tune in again. Uh, same way, uh, it's just on Friday. And then our Easter Sunday service, 10 a.m. Uh, please tune into those again. And uh, yeah, as we head out, I want this to be our reminder this week. Psalms 46 1. It says, God is our refuge and strength a very present help in times of trouble. Notice the wording, not a distant, but very present help in times of trouble. We serve a king who is here with us. Go in peace, friends. Oh,
so